Hi there. Thanks for joining us on this Monday edition of Jamaica Magazine with me, Theodore Henry. I'm your host. It's Road Safety Awareness Month and, of course, we're celebrating 60 years of political independence all year long. So we have to put together a program that's sure to not only heighten your celebration of Jamaica 60, but also increase your focus on safety as you walk, ride and drive on our roads. Our program continues with a word of advice followed by the news. Stay with us. The tinting of your windscreen, cut it out. Public passenger vehicles, according to the Transport Authority Act, not supposed to have tints. I'm appealing to motorists out there. We have removed many plates because of fandangles that are on the motor vehicle. Colorful lights, red light, purple light, blue light, and these color, multicolored lights. Get them off. I've noticed some trends out there where there is different type of license plates on motor vehicles. Only the Jamaican issued driver's license plates are to be on the motor vehicles. Once you transport any passenger in the motor vehicle, ensure that they are buckled, whether they are on the front or they are on the back. Um, the seatbelt gives people a fighting chance to survive the crash. Many people have died who never give themselves a fighting chance. Good day, I'm Stephen McHugh and this is your JIS News for Monday, June 13, 2022. The Ministry of Tourism is looking to tap into the local labor force to identify, recruit and deploy at least 10,000 of the 90,000 workers required in the global cruise industry. Portfolio Minister Edmund Bartlett says the demand stems from a shortage of workers caused by the COVID-19 pandemic's disruption of tourism activities worldwide. He says the ministry and stakeholder partners will be diligent in ensuring that the process of identifying and recruiting potential employees does not disturb the local hospitality sector. So we're focusing on the south coast where we don't have the strength of the hotels. So a level of portability that has to be created among our own workers. And it's one that we have to encourage, but we also have to manage. Minister Bartlett was speaking during a ceremony at the Jamaica Pegasus Hotel on Friday. He lamented emerging reports suggesting that persons have been posing as recruiting agents and are charging potential workers up to $200,000 to secure tourism jobs on their behalf. Stop it! Nobody is to pay an agent or any intermediary for any recruitment opportunities for work in the tourism sector. And if we find it, we're going to treat them as scammers and the law will take its course. In the meantime, the Tourism Ministry has developed a comprehensive suite of tools designed to bolster the sector's resilience and safeguard it against disruptions, such as weather-related events. The suite of tools includes a disaster risk management plan template and guidelines, a business continuity plan template and guidebook, and a national destination assurance framework and strategy. They are intended to provide clear guidance to the management and staff of tourism entities on the basic infrastructure and operating procedures for dealing with emergencies. It's about building capacity overall to understand these disruptions I spoke about too know how to mitigate, to manage, to recover, to recover quickly, and hopefully to thrive thereafter. The Portfolio Minister presented the disaster risk management tools to two of the industry's representatives, the Jamaica Hotel and Tourist Association and the Association of Jamaican Attractions Limited on Friday. During the ceremony, representatives of ODPEM, TPDCO and several municipal corporations were awarded certification after receiving training to engage industry stakeholders and guide their implementation of the business continuity plan. The House of Representatives has paved the way for all assets of the Jamaica Development Bank to be transferred to the Development Bank of Jamaica, DBJ, and complete the dissolution of the former entity. The DBJ was created in April 2000 from the merger of the National Development Bank Limited and the Agricultural Development Credit Bank. 
Consequent to this merger, the affairs of the Jamaica Development Bank became the purview of the DBJ. The bill before this Honorable House now seeks to complete the dissolution process. The Jamaica Development Bank Repeal Act 2022 will now go to the Senate for its approval, having been passed in the lower house on Tuesday without amendments. The Minister of Finance explains that it facilitates the transfer of the liabilities and assets of the Jamaica Development Bank. The liabilities of the JDB shall be the liabilities of the government of Jamaica. In exchange for the transfer of the rights and assets of the JDB to the DBJ, the DBJ shall issue shares in the DBJ to the Accountant General equal to the value of the assets remaining as at the appointed day. The legislation also provides for the exemption of transfer tax and stamp duty that would otherwise be applicable to the transfer or disposal of assets by the DBJ. Government will be removing the absolute ban on new admissions to infirmaries across the island effective Friday, July 1. The state prohibited new admissions to the island's 16 infirmaries in 2020 as one of the measures to contain the spread of COVID-19 and protect the 1,100 residents that currently reside in those facilities. But Minister of Local Government and Rural Development Desmond McKenzie says it is now time to open the infirmaries to new occupants. Every infirmary now as a long list of persons waiting to be admitted or waiting to take up a place in the infirmary. He says the reopening will be done under certain conditions and guidelines. Each person who will apply for consideration will have to be fully vaccinated they will have to have a COVID test done prior to entering the facility. They will be placed in isolation for whatever period the isolation lasts for. And then after they have finished the isolation and they will take one more COVID test. And once they have passed that, they will be admitted to the infirm. Minister McKenzie made the announcement on Friday as he addressed the Homeless Wellness Day of Care at Jarrett Park in Montego Bay. He adds that there will continue to be restricted access regarding visitation as the COVID-19 pandemic is still ongoing. And finally, the Jamaica Cultural Development Commission, JCDC, has been tasked with amplifying its support to ensure the Jamaica Festival Song Competition can return next year with improved entries. Culture Minister Olivia Grange made the announcement in Parliament last week as she announced that the 2022 competition would not go forward as the selection panel was unable to identify 10 suitable songs from the 123 entries received. Under the circumstances, the Jamaica Cultural Development Commission will be refunding all entry fees in the amount of $123,000. And I have instructed the JCDC that they must ramp up the Jamaica Festival Song Workshops over the next 12 months, now that the COVID restrictions have been lifted, to ensure that the competition returns next year with much improved entries. Minister Grange says that in place of the normal festival song competition and album this year, a Jamaica 60 commemorative album will be produced. It will include two of the songs from this year's entry and will broadly feature a mix of leading reggae ambassadors and emerging artists. And that's it for JIS News Today. I'm Stephen McHugh. Thanks for watching. It's Jamaica 60. We're reigniting our great nation, and part of that effort is a national cleanup program. Join in on making Jamaica beautiful by managing your waste. Every single day, every living thing creates waste. What's waste? It's any substance that we discard of or throw out after it has served its primary purpose. For example, after having the water in this bottle, I no longer need it so the bottle becomes waste. Here in Jamaica, we create an average of over 8,000 tons of solid waste per day. We, uh, from time to time, do what we call garbage characterization survey. 
This is where we actually go island-wide and take samples of the garbage and look at what makes up the garbage, what's the composition of the garbage. Regardless of what makes up your garbage, if you don't dispose of them correctly, we'll contribute to air and water pollution, flooding and diseases while influencing climate change. That's why today we'll look at the different types of waste and the best ways to dispose of them. Well, lunch was good, sorry you missed it, but I want to point out how much waste I created from just 30 minutes of eating. I have this empty water bottle, well, almost empty, a lunch box, I have napkins, a fork, and I have some leftovers. So far, I've created organic, recyclable, and solid waste. Other types of waste include hazardous and liquid, Let's go ahead and break them down while looking on how to dispose of each. Let's start with organic waste. Organic waste is any material that is biodegradable and comes from either a plant or an animal. Examples include paper, leftover food, leaves, branches, and livestock manure. Over time, organic waste eventually breaks down into fertilizer but not if it goes to the landfill. <laughs> That's not good. There it will produce methane, and high levels of methane can reduce the amount of oxygen in the air, which will affect our breathing. So, where should it go? Organic waste shouldn't go into your bin. Take it round a back and start a composting heap. We believe that composting provides that excellent opportunity. Composting is rather simple. Cut the bottom from a container and place it directly on the ground in a cool or shaded location in your backyard. First, we start with some grass from the lawn. I have some cardboard that I bought some things at the store and I got, this is cardboard. So I just cut it up and I chew it in. Then add wood chips fruits and vegetable waste, and animal waste from your cows or goats. You need moisture, you need hair. Keep your compost moist and stir it regularly. More. We would produce the best soil nutrients for our flower beds, our farms, our little kitchen gardens. We will then be cutting back on expense in buying fertilizer. Liquid waste includes fluids such as domestic wastewater, sewage, processed water, grease or other liquids. Wastewater from doing the dishes, laundry and showering are considered grey water and can be used in your garden. Hazardous waste can be liquid or solid. It includes all types of rubbish that are flammable, toxic, corrosive, and reactive. First things first, don't throw hazardous waste, whether liquid or solid, in your bin. Follow the labels on hazardous products for disposal instructions and buy the exact amount that you need. So if you use all of it, you really don't have any waste. You can flush some hazardous household wastes followed by plenty of water. This only applies though to hazardous household waste that can be neutralized by water. And when in doubt, reach out to the NSWMA. Solid waste is any tangible item that has already served its primary purpose and is discarded by individuals. This type of waste is commonly broken down into plastic, paper, metals, tins, ceramics, and glass. The good news is that most of the solid waste we create are recyclable and compostable. That's another reason it's important to separate your garbage. 
This way, you can create a compost heap with your solid organic waste and recycle bottles, furniture, and other solid waste. For those in terrible condition, drop them in your Jomadi gates and the NSWMA will be there on the double for them. And if you don't have a drum, the NSWMA will provide one under its Jomadi gate initiative. So we are issuing you with your own drums. So you have control over your receptacles, don't it? So your garbage don't have to be littered all over the place. Recyclable waste refers to all the items we can convert into products that are useful. These include my water bottle, solid items such as paper, metals, furniture, and organic waste. Well, you don't really dispose of recyclable waste. At least, you shouldn't. Reusing or upscaling is the way to go. We're all responsible for the waste we create, and by separating them and practicing proper waste disposal, we'll create a beautiful, safe, and healthy environment, doing our part to make Jamaica the place of choice to live, work, raise families, and do business. June is observed annually as Road Safety Awareness Month, and for good reason. Last year, 487 persons lost their lives on the nation's roads, 25 of which were children. We want to raise your consciousness to how highly preventable these incidents can be if we practice safe road usage. Government is playing its part with the introduction of the Safe Passage Project. Take a look. is an intervention to support the safe commute of children to and from school using specific roadways and thoroughfares. Road safety is a national cause for concern as hundreds of Jamaicans including children have lost their lives annually due to road accidents. The police and citizens do welcome the Safe Passage project. This project is not only beneficial to our youngsters, but by extension, the community. The project has already been implemented in eight schools across Jamaica under the first phase of the Integrated Community Development Project, the ICDP, which was funded by the World Bank. And building on the success of phase one, the Safe Passages Project is now being implemented under the Government of Jamaica's ICDP2 project in five communities, Salt Spring and Anchovy in St. James, Tread Light in Clarendon, Greenwich Town in Kingston, and August Town in St. Andrew. Three of these safe passages, including within Salt Spring, are Government of Jamaica targets under the EU's Citizen Security Program for financial year 2021-22. Ceremony to hand over a safe passage. And let me tell you that indeed, when we help the government to implement the citizen security plan to make sure that children can go from the two places in their life which should be, you know, where they should be safest between home and school, one cannot say that that is not contributing to citizen security and to their well being. So I'm extremely happy to see that we have included interventions like this in our support. It is not just a road safety project, it's a community project where everyone gets involved. The project does not stop with the infrastructure, it also includes a comprehensive public education and road safety program targeting staff and students, residents, transport providers and other road users by educating them on proper road usage. It is my hope that this Safe Passage project 
will attract other stakeholders to build on this foundation. We know how pretty sidewalks and guardrails. No car can bounce with them, cause we know in a them way. And we see a passage, we get we see a passage. This safe passage in Salt Spring boasts all the features which have become synonymous with the project. At a cost of $14 million, 400 meters of sidewalk was constructed with safety guardrails. School traffic signs were installed already and the pedestrian crossing was put in place. Additionally, two bus sheds were constructed, the school fencing was rehabilitated and replaced with a block wall structure decorated with murals depicting messages on road safety. It is my hope that this Safe Passage program will have the outcome of providing safe commute for students, staff and other pedestrians in partnership with the wider community and other stakeholders. Roots and culture. <laughs> that was in Jamaica 60. Jamaica 60? What a piece of news, Miss Matty. I feel like my heart going boss up. Just in. The island of Jamaica is on the verge of celebrating its 60th year of independence. A whole in way of celebrating it. <laughs> they said the people, them, you know, them come here, you know. But you see, when our people decide, say the other people, them free paper, burn up. Them say if it's war, start it, whatever. We are collect medal, brand of it, you know. Medal. The celebrations are slated to begin on January 1st, 2022. Organized by the Ministry of Culture, Gender, Entertainment and Sport, we have more in this report. I am on site and planning activities are ablaze. Persons are advised to download the Reggae Jamaica app to know what it pre. Why pre? <laughs> activities for the Jamaica 60 celebration. Yeah. If you don't know the app, you get the updates then. Accidents do happen especially on the nation's roads. If you're involved in a road crash, we want to help you by sharing the necessary steps to take. You know how they say accidents do happen, unexpectedly and often unintentionally. Though road safety experts no longer define these unfortunate incidents involving motor vehicles as accidents, they're certainly never intended. Unfavorable weather conditions, objects on the road, your miscalculation while driving, or another driver can cause crashes, even for the best defensive drivers. That's exactly why it's important to know how to respond in these situations. So, what do you do at that exact moment? What should be your next steps? And when and how should you file a police report? For the number of reports that, are, that come to this station, um, perhaps it's on a basis of about 10 to 15 per day. That's the number of accidents per day. So after a road traffic accident, um, person should first try to clear the roadway if they are obstructing the traffic for other uh, motorists. Secondly, um, drivers are expected to exchange vehicle documents and the document should include their registration certificate certificate of fitness, insurance certificate, and your driver's license information. Those are the essential four pieces of information that should be provided to both parties after an accident. Contact information is optional, but you have cases where a person tries to settle outside insurance, and that's now a civil matter. It's an agreement between both parties, so if they want to exchange um, contact information, that's also optional, depending on the intention that they have in terms of fixing the vehicle outside insurance or what. Your next step, making a police report about the collision. This is always a good idea. That way you have proof of exactly what happened and the scope of any injuries. In terms of our approach as police officers for a motor vehicle accident, um, first the, the critical thing is to check for, for injuries, make sure that um, persons are okay. Um, if there's a need for persons to be assisted to the hospital for any um, sort of treatment, we should make sure we render assistance to persons in need of that care first. 
Um, secondly, we check for um, the damage for the vehicles, make sure there is no obstruction um, along the roadway and then we can treat with the documents or the exchange of particulars between both parties. After making a report of a motor vehicle accident, um, the next step that persons are advised to do is to make a, make a report to their insurance company and that's for another motorist as it relates to a pedestrian um, who are persons who are injured. They are also advised to get the assistance of an attorney to file a personal injury um, claim against the, the party that is liable in the accident. For follow-up visits, um, what we do, we have cases where persons are, are seriously injured, some of which are not able to make it to the station to give a report in the first instance. So what we try to do, whether the persons are hospitalized, we ensure that visits are made and that the person's conditions are updated as we go along. As we, through the investigation, we ensure that the person's conditions are updated along the, the procedure. But are you always required to report traffic collisions? Not in all cases, a report must be filed um, for accidents. Um, we have situations where it could be a very minor mishap. For example, someone could be reversing from their garage, they could bump their gate. So in those cases, it's not necessary for them to make a report. But for other situations involving another motorist or a case where a pedestrian or a property is damaged, a report is expected to be made because persons at times are expected to make claims, whether from their insurance company or their attorneys, based on the damage received or the injuries they've sustained. On a more global level, studies from the World Health Organization, WHO, show that approximately 1.35 million people die each year as a result of road traffic crashes, and 3% of most countries' gross domestic product is spent on road traffic crashes. The most common cause of motor vehicle accidents, from my understanding, is mostly impatience on the part of some of the drivers and a lack of knowledge as to how the roadways should be used. And I also believe the implementation of, of traffic signs at various areas would also aid the process because most drivers are not aware of what to do at various parts of the roadway. In the face of such figures, even the most careful driver can suddenly encounter a bit of bad fortune on the road. You know that scene. Decisions can be like car accidents, sudden and full of consequences. So how about making the right decision to be responsible road users today? You ever hear the saying, chicken Mary hawk the near? How about fire there must must tail him think a cool breeze? Or hand in a lion mouth, take time, take you out. These are just some Jamaican proverbs that have been used over the years to teach us right from wrong. And this our 60th year of independence, we want to pass them on to our children. So for those who've never heard or don't understand when it said chicken merry hawk the near, what's meant is that even in happy times, one must always be mindful and prepared for danger. The same is true for the saying, fire there must must tail him think a cool breeze. We should never get complacent and ignore signs of danger. And I'm sure you're able to decipher this one. Hand in a lion mouth, take time, take you out. It simply means when you're caught in a bad situation, be patient, as acting speedy will only make matters worse. It's Jamaica 60. Come make we walk and talk. <laughs> And that's how we leave you on this Monday edition of Jamaica Magazine. We return tomorrow with another exciting program just for you. Catch up on this and past episodes on our YouTube channel. Keep up to date on the latest happenings in Jamaica land we love by joining us on all the major social media platforms. We're also available on our website and through our mobile app. On behalf of the entire team here at the JIS, I'm Theodore Henry. Thanks for watching. This has been a production of the Jamaica Information Service, the voice of Jamaica.